experts say we are living in a determining decade. What does that mean? United Nations predicts the damage that we do in the next decade will create an irreversible effect on the planet. Sustainable business is vital to save and preserve our planet. Responsible businesses keeping social, environment and governance goals is of paramount importance now. We have with us Mr. Anirban Ghosh, Chief Sustainability Officer of the Mahindra Group. Anirban, it's good to see you. With over a decade of hands-on experience in the field of sustainability, you are just the right person to help us guide in our journey of sustainability. Thank you for your kind words, Sunil. In the recent years, we've been hearing about sustainability, climate change, planet, doomsday. <laughs> so what is the story of sustainability in your view? You know, Sunil, the story of sustainability in some ways is new and in some ways is not new. When you look at it from an organization's perspective, organizations have always wanted to be sustainable. But something has happened in the recent past which uh, has created a situation where organizations have to do a few different things to be sustainable, say, for the next 50 odd years. And these different things are related to the changes that are happening to the climate. Uh, all our technologies uh, that have been discovered result in some emissions or the other. For a long time, it wasn't too much of a problem because emissions were very low and the earth had the ability to handle it. But population grew, emissions grew and now it's a little bit too much. There's too much carbon dioxide in the air and that's causing warming and a whole lot of uh, dystopian conditions like all these storms and hurricanes and everything that we see, you know. So projections are that if it continues this way, there will be way too much disruption and it will be very uncomfortable for people like you and me to live on the planet. Therefore, the new story of sustainability is to do business in a way or why just business is to live in a way where emissions are much lower, uh, hopefully zero, net zero and um, we make sure that the average temperature rise does not cross 1.5 or at max 2 degrees centigrade. Then we will be able to keep things under control. So what are some of the benefits business can get by taking sustainable actions? You know, the more we take sustainable actions, Sunil, we realize there are so many benefits we can get. Last count, I think I counted something like a dozen. So let me try and uh, enumerate a few. Uh, at the very least, through actions in energy efficiency and renewable energy, you can cut operating costs. Yeah. There are many other ways uh, in which you will be able to cut operating costs by being climate friendly depending on the sort of business you are in. Apart from cutting costs, it is also possible to create value from say the wastes that you produce. Yeah. Many organizations are creating millions of dollars of value from the wastes that they produce. Some businesses are discovering that you can get into new businesses which are climate friendly. In the Mahindra group, there is a number of businesses like solar energy, electric vehicles, micro irrigation, cloud computing for that matter, all of which are climate friendly and there are more. So depending on your business, you might, you could figure out new businesses to get into. But very importantly, Sunil, the environment is changing. The expectations of companies from stakeholders is changing. The rules and regulations are changing. Just to be compliant, we will have to take climate action. If we don't take climate action, we won't be compliant and that's not a good place for business to be. And some very interesting things are developing like uh, you can already get better access to talent if you are seen as a responsible corporation taking climate action. But recently I've seen that uh, banks and lenders are coming around to giving uh, better rates of interest to companies who are considered to be effective in climate action. 
So, having access to low cost funds, a greater license to operate because stakeholders give you a slightly longer rope if you are uh, you know good on uh, climate action. So, all of these benefits result in a far more resilient business. Right? Um, if you are serving clients who have committed to being carbon neutral, uh, it is important for you as a supplier uh, to be taking strong climate action because not only will your clients be asking you to take the right action, uh, unless you take the right action, they can't achieve their climate goals. So, lots of benefits from uh, climate action, you know. We know sustainability is built in UN goals, but does achieving sustainability is seen as an expense to businesses? Is there a business sense to invest in it? This is probably the biggest myth that surrounds sustainability, that sustainability is an expense. There are so many ways in which you can actually save or make money by taking strong climate action. The reason why this conversation happens is because some technologies are not economically feasible yet, but there are many that are. So, today we must adopt all those technologies which are economically feasible, either help us save money or help us make money. Right? And as we are doing so, more and more technologies will become economically feasible and we will be ready to adopt them as well. Just some examples, in the Mahindra group when we invested in uh, say LED lighting or energy efficient motors or energy efficient air conditioning, our returns on investment were always greater than our hurdle rate. Of course, therefore, sustainable action makes uh, business sense. But there is another way of looking at it. You are taking sustainable action because you want to be around for the long run. If, you, if we do not take strong sustainable actions or climate actions today, as policies, regulations change, as things become much stricter in the business environment, uh, existence itself will be in question. Therefore, to say that sustainable actions cost money, maybe we should ask the question, how much would you want to pay to remain in business? What are some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome these issues? There were a number of challenges, Sunil, but if I were to summarize them, uh, I could go with uh, sustainability costs money, sustainability is not my business and I have too many other things to do. Oh, there is another one which goes, uh, I want to do the right thing, but I do not know how and I do not know what. Okay. So, let me just uh, mention how we went about addressing these things uh, within the Mahindra group. We realized very quickly that uh, sustainability actions actually give good returns on investment. So, then it was only about how can we scale these kinds of actions. So, that one was less difficult to deal with once we got started. Before we get started, all these questions keep coming. Right. Now, the question of what do we do when we actually want to take actions? We got a lot of help from the business ecosystem and even the, the non-profit ecosystem because the conversation on uh, living in a sustainable way had actually started a long time ago. It is just that the conversation had not come to businesses. It is only in recent times that businesses have actually started engaging in the conversation. So, lots of solutions were already available and whatever was available we started adopting and we found more and more opportunities which is why we have committed to being carbon neutral by 2040. Then of course, there were the uh, say uh, issues of uh, engaging people in the journey. The way we phrased the problem Sunil was how do we leverage sustainability to do business better. So, if I am a marketing person, how do I leverage sustainability to do my job better? Or if I am a supply chain person, how do I leverage sustainability to do supply chain work uh, better? When we ask the question in this way, 
the challenge of sustainability is not my job just went away. It got converted to what in sustainability is relevant to my job. Right? So, my colleague in uh, manufacturing, uh, he keeps saying that 70 percent of my controllable costs are related to energy. So, if energy efficiency is a sustainability thing, I am happy to do it because it is my job. Right? So, in this way, we were able to address uh, the various myths that surround sustainability and the various challenges. It is quite a journey. Um, so, bringing people on takes time. In the Mahindra group, we have got this program called Make Sustainability Personal, where we do a lot of workshops uh, and people get a sense of if they want to make a contribution to the climate solution, what can they do as a person at their place of work and also at home. So, to summarize, it is more awareness, engaging more people, giving them the sense that this makes business sense. Oh, of course, lots of awareness, but then also making technologies available, also doing lots of pilots, so that you know people start believing that, oh yes, there is value in this. Companies talk about science-based targets. What exactly are these? You know, Sunil, there was a time when many organizations would talk about initiatives they were taking. At the same time, the Paris Agreement had been signed and some goals had been set that we had to stay within 2 degrees centigrade, preferably 1.5. But it was very difficult to make out whether an organization was taking adequate action or not. How would we say that, yes, we are taking enough action? Science-based targets help us in kind of determining what amount of decarbonization would be effective as a contribution from our side uh, towards uh, the Paris goals. So, four uh, climate non-profits came together, CDP, uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, UNGC and World Resources Institute. They did all the mathematics and the hard work uh, about, you know, which country, which sector, what is the extent of decarbonization that will be required and set goals. And so, those have are now called the science based targets. And if you were to have a target approved from the science based targets initiative and you work to achieve that, you can legitimately say that you are taking adequate climate action uh, consistent with the Paris Accord. Okay, okay. And are these nice to have? targets or are these mandated by the uh, governing authority? I would not use the word mandated. I would say that uh, these are targets which are, um, which are effective contributions to climate action. If we achieve these targets, then we will achieve the Paris Accord. Um, they come from the perspective of what is required. Uh, to keep average temperatures below 2 degrees or 1 and a half degrees centigrade. Uh, it is up to us as an industry to figure out uh, how to do this in a way which is economically feasible or which does not put the business at risk. Luckily, there are a lot of opportunities in the overlap between planet and profit and that is why we have a hope that we will be able to take enough climate action. What are some of the challenges in achieving these science-based targets and becoming net zero? The biggest challenge in achieving science-based targets is having access to enough decarbonization technologies and of course, implementing them. The technologies that are available today will help us achieve our decarbonization targets till 2030, uh, if they are extensively adopted. But the targets that we have for 2050, 50 percent of that decarbonization will come from technologies which are not economically feasible yet. So, that is a big challenge really, because unless those uh, technologies come on stream, it will be difficult to achieve the goal still 2050. 
in addition, however much decarbonization we do, I think we have all come around to understanding that there will be residual emissions. So, to be net zero, we have to effectively remove carbon from, uh, from the atmosphere. And therefore, we have to plant trees, we have to make the mangroves become more robust, and we may even have to adopt uh, technical solutions like direct air capture. If we are able to figure out a way to take carbon out of the air and use it for something economically feasible, then our chances of becoming uh, net zero are much, much higher. So, in short, these are the short sort of challenges that exist in the path to sci achieving science-based targets and becoming net zero. What role does carbon offsetting play in achieving net zero? Sunil, so, till a couple of centuries ago, the ability of the earth to sequester carbon from the air was greater than the emissions that were happening. But by and by that changed and that is why the average temperature of the earth has gradually been going up. The challenge is that the pace at which it is going up is a little too rapid and the way we live, uh, emissions happen from almost any activity that we do. As we look forward and try to do deep decarbonization, whatever we do, we realize that there will be some emissions left. There is already too much carbon in the air, we cannot afford to add to that stock. Therefore, if there are going to be residual emissions, we have to compensate for them in some way. And that is what carbon offsetting does. Uh, it helps us um, take the residual emissions that we have made and pull it out of the air by increasing the carbon sequestration capacity of the earth. So, on earth trees and the ocean and mangroves, they help us sequester carbon. This is why we have to adopt these nature based solutions. There is also a fear Sunil that nature based solutions may not be enough. So, we will have to have technical solutions like direct air capture and carbon capture and usage, uh, maybe carbon capture and storage uh, to be net zero. So, we hear these buzzwords in various forums, climate change, climate crisis, global warming. They are talking about the same problem, but they are interconnected in some way. So, climate is changing, uh, it is changing and therefore, warming is happening, the average temperature is rising and because it is rising too much too quickly, we are facing a climate crisis. So, that is how they are all connected. So, the problem to chase is the rise in temperature that we see happening and the solution to chase is reducing the emissions which is causing it. Which is causing the rise in temperatures, that is right. So, what are the main threats posed by this climate change? So, when we say climate change, essentially what we are saying is that the earth is getting warmer. As the earth gets warmer, uh, a whole lot of other uh, reactions happen. So, ice starts melting, when ice starts melting, sea level starts rising. When all of this happens, uh, it disrupts the uh, precipitation cycle. So, then you have many more days with extreme precipitation uh, and associated with all of this, because temperatures are rising, uh, there is a threat to labor productivity going down. So, in this way, it is a, it is actually a cascading set of threats, yeah, which begins with uh, rising temperature and a whole bunch of uh, dystopian realities which cascade uh, as because of the rise in temperature. This in turn puts uh, various kinds of risks for businesses. So, uh, disruption of the supply chain, labor productivity itself. Uh, is a big thing. And then it can become a vicious cycle, because 
rising temperatures, you will want more cooling, more cooling means more emissions, more emissions means more warming and so that becomes a vicious cycle sort of a thing. So, these are the interconnected ways in which uh, the challenges emerge from uh, climate change and there are so many different levels that as we keep talking, we can keep uncovering more and more levels, but what we have discussed are the basic things, uh, basic threats of climate change. As they say, we are living in a determining decade, but how much time do we really have to stop this climate change? We do not have any time at all. Action should have started yesterday. You know, there is already too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We are experiencing it in many different ways. Uh, this year, uh, India's monsoons were such that most of the rainfall occurred in some very few days. You know, that is a clear sign of accelerating pace of climate change. Till recently, we never used to have uh, hurricanes on the west coast of India, but now we do and sometimes we have more than one in a year. So, clearly climate change is accelerating and we really cannot wait to take action, we have to take action now. The latest IPCC report uh, says that climate is actually changing much faster than we would anticipated change even 5 years ago. right? And the goal is to cut emissions by half by 2030 and be net zero by 2050. Very stretch goals and clearly not a second to lose. So, the action has to happen now? Right away and as much as possible. How does one start to implement a solution to accelerate the climate change? You first have to know where you are. So, the best place to start is do baselining and find out what are your emissions today. That is what we did in Mahindra 14 years ago. Once you know where you are and what is causing emissions, then we have to explore what are the appropriate solutions and that will vary from industry to industry um, and the technologies that people will adopt will also vary from industry to industry. But there are some broad similarities. For example, uh, every industry will be looking for ways to do deep decarbonization. Whether it is energy efficiency technologies or it is say fuel switching technologies, you know such as fossil fuel to hydrogen or what is the right way to do deep decarbonization will depend on the industry uh, that we are talking about. Now, having done the or having gone through this process of deep decarbonization. In fact, the mission possible report says it very in a very nice way. Uh, it says uh, electrify everything and decarbonize electricity. So, lots of renewable energy and lots of electrification where it is not possible uh, fuel switching to hydrogen will work, but there is a new uh, possibility which I do not think has been exploited enough yet, which is leveraging technologies like uh, IoT and IT as a force multiplier. Uh, you know, I used to be very happy that uh, we were achieving 30, 35 percent uh, energy efficiency in buildings, till I heard that you could use a lot of very interesting technology based on IoT and building on that and actually deepen decarbonization to 75 percent in a building. So, that just told me that uh, technologies can uh, have a force multiplier effect over and above the core technologies that are used to decarbonize. But the beginning point has to be baselining. So, the role technology can play is, is in assimilating all the data to define a baseline and then measure the various metrics to really guide you which one you should focus on. Oh, absolutely. It can go a little bit beyond that also, you know, you can automate a whole lot of things and that is where the IOTs and sensors can play a part. As a individual, how can I reduce my carbon footprint? 
very good question Sunil. There are some things you can do straight away really. Uh, we have always been taught that when we are leaving a room, we should switch off the lights and the fans and the air conditioners and so on. We have done it because we have grown up in a situation where electricity was scarce. But we can do it now because using lesser electricity leads to lesser emissions and all of us can do this. I found a few very interesting things that can be done. Um, when you are using an air conditioner, use the timer and keep it on for an hour or two and let it switch off on its own. The room remains comfortable for another five or six hours. I have never woken up after the air conditioner has gone off. You know, um, you can also keep the air conditioner at a temperature of 24, 23 degrees centigrade, whatever is comfortable for you, so that you are not shivering and need a cover. Yeah? We do not always connect uh, water and emissions, but every drop of water we use is pumped multiple times in multiple places uh, to be sent to different uh, places. So, if we use less water, we actually reduce pumping, which in turn reduces uh, emissions. Right? And to use less water, um, now there are aerators available, which if you put in your tap, you can clean your hands in just as good a manner as before but you are using anywhere up to 80 percent less water right? and you have low flow fixtures. Um, recently, I have been noticing most new buildings have dual flushes. So, these are little things that can very easily be done to reduce our own carbon footprint, but these are the easy ones. There are some slightly tougher ones uh, like when we are using a car. I think it is time we started moving to electric vehicles as quickly as we can or use as much public transport as we can or when we are buying an air ticket, see whether the airline gives you an option to offset the emissions from your flight. Right? And when we are uh, say clothes and anything else that we are consuming, if we are a little conscious that we are consuming what we require and not too much more. So, I look at my wardrobe and I see the clothes that are there and ask the question, what have I not used for a year? Does it need to be here? And then find ways to recycle them. These are just some examples. Oh, I missed food. Uh, you are a vegetarian, right? Non-vegetarian. Oh, you are a non-vegetarian. You have a lot of opportunity then. So, more vegetarian food is better for the climate uh, because one of the major contributors to emissions is livestock. So, moving towards uh, vegetarian food helps. And I understand that there are uh, very interesting experiments in creation of lab meat. Some people say it is as good as the real thing and that it is much better for the climate. Well, we will have to figure out a way of changing our food habits. That may be much tougher than uh, you know, buying less clothes or switching off the electricity, but uh, all of these things come in a package. A lot for you to do. So, in talking about emissions, we hear about uh, scope 1, 2 and 3. Where does one start defining what these are and how do we calculate these? So, scope in terms of emissions uh, relates with where the emission is occurring. Scope 1 is when it is occurring within the boundaries of the organization. So, let us say in an automobile factory, we are burning some gas or diesel to generate heat for a process. So, the emissions caused by burning of gas or uh, diesel there is called scope 1 within the boundaries. Scope 2 is uh, purchased electricity. So, the emissions because of the electricity we are using, the emissions are actually happening outside because we are purchasing electricity. So, those are called scope 2 and scope 3 is outside the boundaries of our organization. Um, say when goods are being sent by a vehicle from the factory to another location or parts are being brought in from suppliers to our uh, factory, 
the emissions caused during that transport would be scope 3. Um, say for an automobile, if you and I are using an automobile, then the emissions because of the fuel we are burning would be scope 3 for the manufacturer of that automobile. Or we are here in this building, we are consuming energy to live in it. The emissions because of that is scope 3 for the person who constructed this building. Yeah? So, that is what scope 1, scope 2 and scope 3 are. So, sounds a bit complex, but is it uh, fair to assume based on the energy you spend, there is an equivalent of emission that you have to track and measure as your uh, carbon footprint? You have got to measure all three actually, all three scopes. Uh, scope 1 and scope 2 we have direct responsibility for. Scope 3 we have to work with others to be able to bring it down, uh, but we have to measure all three. And let me try and make it simple if I can. So, scope 1 occurs within the boundaries of the organization, scope 2 is purchased electricity and scope 3 is emissions outside the boundary of the organization, but connected to the business in some way. So, when the uh, products we use comes to its natural end of life, what do we do with this? Does it harm the environment in any way? Oh yes, it harms the environment if you do not handle it properly. Today our way of managing products that have come to end of life is not good at all. So, you know, we, it goes into some water body, it goes to landfill, um, it causes emissions of some kind or it spoils the soil. Uh, it definitely has a negative effect on environment, but products reaching end of life are actually a huge opportunity going forward, because it is possible to recycle the material in that product and use it again without going into mining and creating more steel or aluminum or plastic as the case may be. So, it is a massive opportunity. In fact, it is an area called circular economy and uh, every business will soon be exploring how it can mine uh, waste, shall we say. Uh, mine materials to use from what was considered as waste. Just a few days ago, the Prime Minister announced that the mountains of garbage that we have in uh, various cities will be processed and we will get rid of the mountains. And if we manage uh, our uh, products reaching end of life sustainably in a responsible manner, we will not create new mountains of garbage. So, there is a huge opportunity and if we do not take that, we will continue to cause untold harm to the environment, which we have been doing over the last so many years. So, Neil, if we, when we look around in the places we stay, it is not difficult to spot examples of environmental degradation. Have you experienced anything in your life? Yep, actually plenty of them. So, I come from a city called Chennai, mm. right? And uh, what is noticeably happening around us is there is an unplanned urbanization which is happening in all our towns. Mm. So, that leads to degradation of natural resources, mm. right? And our administration is still figuring out how to do proper waste management, mm. how to get rid of single use plastics, reuse. They are still learning and they are in a very infancy stage. Mm. And what this has done is when the population rises in the urban towns, people cannot manage their waste properly, there is no segregation and all that is collected is getting dumped into landfills. Mm. And in the town that I come from, a beautiful lake was converted into a landfill even until like five years ago. So, there was a huge 20 feet tall mountain, mounds of plastic waste dumped into the lake mm. because there was no segregation, there is no proper bio mining, nothing of that sort. Mm. But the good thing is there are citizen activists rising in these various towns including my own. Mm. We have youngsters now starting to see that as a problem, mm. which is causing drastic issues for the town we live in. Mm. We could see flood coming up every every corner and then we see uh, water scarcity hitting us right in the next mm. uh, cycle of the season. And the root cause as we analyzed is because these natural resources are spoiled. So, the lake which is supposed to carry rainwater is filled with plastic waste and sewage is let to fill it in. And when rain comes in, it does not catch the rainwater, it just lets it flow through the sea. 
So this awareness has now uh, made these young youngsters to take these things into their hands and work with the government to push them to recover some of these natural resources. You said till recently, so has the situation changed? Yeah, so in the last uh, three years, there are some noticeable changes that are happening in some of the lakes in our town at least. Mm. So we could see the landfill getting removed. We are seeing the sewage getting deflected. Now the lake is only carrying rainwater and there are different measures taken to move the trash to a place which is not a water body. But still, I mean, there is still a lot more things to be done to manage our waste properly, which I'm sure with uh, the participation of like-minded citizens, we can achieve better results. Fantastic. So we were talking about things individuals can do and I was telling you small things, but you've done something so much bigger. Wonderful. Thank you.